My name is Menachem. My friends call me Mickey. Mickey Warshawski. Let me begin by saying that I didn't come here to upset you with anguish or unload my anguish on you. I came here primarily because I respect you and because someday you will be leaders of and tone givers of this great country of ours. I came here with the hope that you may learn something good from my life experiences. I was born, interestingly, in a bed that my grandma was born in and her siblings were born in. My mother and her siblings were born in the same house, in the same bed, and so was I. And my two sisters and my younger brother was born in the same bed. So I come from a family where father's side of the family and mother's side of the family lived in Poland for hundreds of years, probably around five, six hundred years. Um, we were a big family. We were four siblings, father and mother and grandma. There was an aunt who lost her husband and her daughter lived with us. And a uh, young woman who lost her mother at birth. She was brought up in our home. And uh, every meal, we had people sitting with us that could not afford a meal. Uh, particularly in Saturdays and holidays and so on, we, we extended the table more for it. Uh, it was an open door. Father was very active in the community. Uh, I went to a private religious school. It was a normal life, school, play, to a point where there was a garden in our home, or oh, the little synagogue that we belonged to was also on our property in, in the same building that we lived. It was more of a school where, uh, where the liver is from the back and entrance to the front and so on. And uh, I always found a way to get out of services from the synagogue, particularly on Saturdays. And we found something to make a soccer ball out of. It could have been a stuffed, uh, a, a stuffed sock with rags that didn't interfere with our fun of having playing soccer. And one day somebody must have told father where I am. So he came down, grabbed me by the ear and pulled me back to the synagogue. It, it, it wasn't very pleasant, but it's something that stuck in my mind as, to him it was very important obviously. He, he was a medic in the Polish army. And at uh, one point, his superior, which was a sur surgeon, a doctor, wasn't on duty, but he was. And one of patients came in with uh, a ruptured appendix that father diagnosed. He sent a message to the doctor to come immediately, but the doctor was a little drunk, so he sent a message back with an order. You take over and help this man now. 
father never performed surgery before. He helped in a lot of surgeries, but never held a, 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 an instrument. I mean, that he activated. And uh, he performed the operation, and the person lived. So it was such a feather in my father's cap that it happened, and uh, he didn't miss an occasion to tell that story to a friend. He was very generous. We were quite well off in comparison. I was nine years old when the war broke out, and the war broke out the 1st of September. The 7th of September, I saw the first German in our town. And what I saw was two people in black uniforms with a swastika armband, which was like the, the Nazi flag. I remember red and a white circle and a black swastika on it. And uh, one Jewish person, also Orthodox, with a beard and dressed for holiday like, laying on the sidewalk, dead from a bullet, and one of those Nazis took his head, dipped it in blood, and wrote on the sidewalk, J-U-D-E, Jude, Jew. And I was then nine years old. And I ran back home and I told father not to come to the synagogue because it's dangerous. And this was the first impression I had of Nazis. The end of, of December 1939, we were already in a ghetto. But it wasn't, it was an open ghetto. We couldn't get out. But uh, and there were guards all around every block, every place, armed, of course. And they used the arm liberally. So, uh, but by 1942, we were transferred to a bigger ghetto. And father worked also as a medic. And that was, Russians were starvation rations, food rations I'm talking about. And uh, father became very sick. One of, his, one of his friends came, who was a doctor, came to visit him. He told mother that he, father doesn't have much longer to live. Every organ is affected from malnutrition, from and uh, by that time we lived five people. Oh, my little brother was practically kidnapped by the SS. And that was, I read about that. He was seven years old and we haven't seen him since. And uh, we lived five people in a tiny room. The stove was near the bed and the table was near the stove and there was no room for everybody, so there was one big straw bag 
that we received, or we, I don't remember how it came to us. I was 42, I was 12 years old. And, uh, and the agony that I saw my father going through, dying slowly, day by day, wasn't very easy. He died. He's buried in the ghetto. Somewhere there. And uh, it was mother, two sisters and I. And we were on the list to report to the railroad station, which was a part of the ghetto too. We did not respond soon enough, so our ration, the food ration cards were blocked, and we had no food, no food at all, not, not even the meager rations that were available to other people. And mother decided, oh yes, and they offered it, they offered a loaf of bread for anybody that comes voluntarily to the station without being arrested or whatever. So we decided we will probably die here from hunger. So there is an alternative we don't know what it is, but we have to take it. So we went down there, and it's the first time we ate in several days. And soon after, we were shoved into a cattle car. I don't know how many people, but it was very crowded, without food and water. And I think it was about three days, I'm not sure. That it was several days anyway in that car, in the train car. The next time they opened the door, it was Auschwitz. How many of you heard of Auschwitz? The German Nazi city with mass murder as the only industry. I'm a survivor of Auschwitz. Screaming and yelling and gunshots and dogs and barking and, and attacking. I can't describe the details. And prayers and screaming and, and, and hold on to me and don't let go and on and on and on. <laughs> and then was a uh, order, males to the right, women to the left. And somebody pushed me from the back, something to go faster, or to the right, or whatever. I don't remember, it could have been the opposite. And that's the last time I saw my mother and two sisters. And... Uh, And the rest, you probably know what's happening in Auschwitz. It is a well-known fact that prolonged oppression, living conditions, constant threat of death, constant denigration, hunger, freezing cold, dehumanizing and unsanitary and living condition, working conditions, and the loss of your loved ones can change a person's behavior and even a person's character. The Nazis specialized in achieving all that and more. One of my self-promises, prom, 
promised missions was to remember the strong people who were fighting against these influences and all those Nazi tactics. Today I'm going to tell you about one of those men. I call him the Holy Man of Auschwitz. Dr. Nikolai Sebastian and I met when I was brought to his miniature operatory. This operatory was without an x-ray, without medical supplies, without medication, without instruments, none. Originally, it was a broom storage area at the end of our barrack. A slotted bench served as an operating table. The reason for our meeting was my messed up knee, peeled to the bone, and possibly a broken kneecap. This was a direct result of a work accident caused by an activated horse whip in the hands of an S Nazi SS guard. Dr. Nikolai tended to my knee as if I was his only paying patient. He bandaged that knee every few days with pieces of linen torn from dead prisoners' shirts. The environment of the uncivilized Nazi German culture of Auschwitz did not allow cripples like me or sick people to participate in that chosen civilization. They called it Nazis. I was certain that eventually I will be sent back, dead or alive, from my labor camp to the crematorium. The length of my life, I was then a young teen depended only in the frequency of Dr. Mengele coming to inquire about our health. Dr. Mengele was called the angel of death. Meanwhile, I made myself useful in Dr. Nikolai's clinic called Krankenbau, or KB for short. After work hours, I helped by holding down people on the bench when Dr. Nikolai treated their frozen and infected toes without being able to offer any numbing medication. The first time that Dr. Nikolai was notified that Mengele was present in our camp, I was certain that he would come and visit our clinic. Dr. Nikolai dropped everything he was doing, lifted me up on his arms, and deposited me in a barrack where the block leader, the barrack was called the block, where the block leader was his friend. After Mengele left, Dr. Nikolai, Nikolai brought me back where I continued to make myself useful by sharpening handles of broken soup spoon to be used as surgical instruments. Marks of the impact of Menkele hand were visible on Dr. Nikolai's face. When I asked him, what can I do for you? His reply, or short and crisp. Quote, just pass it on. When Mengele came a second time for the selection of his sick and weak pr prisoners, the Schreiber, the camp clerk, had to write down the selected prisoner's number. My number, B6816, excuse me, it's German, that's why I used it, 
was among the ones designated for crematorium, the same number that was forcefully tattooed on my arm when I arrived. Dr. Nikolai and the camp clerk risked not only the, their position and camp privileges, but they also risked their own life. If somebody would uncover, they would shoot all three of us. The clerk had exchanged my prisoner number on that list with the number of another prisoner who had died that day. <laughs> Dr. Nicholas Sebastian died from a Nazi bullet after a long death march. It happened a single day before liberation. We were marched from there further into Germany. The end, about the middle of January 1945, because they knew that the, the Russians are getting closer. Some, at the, some, about the 20 some inch of January, we were still in camp, and we walked for a few days, day and night. Anybody that was too slow to walk with us was shot. And a lot of our some people that I knew were laying in the ditch. And we left them behind as we were urged to keep on going. We came to two camps, one night and then another night and another night, because there the were camps scattered was enough labor available for free that they made labor camps along the line there. The last one was called Blechhammer. And uh, at one time we were 21,000 people there. Uh, they decided, they took out about 9,000 people. They, we, our camp was in a different barrack, so somehow they left us alone. And so they took 9,000 people, including the doctor from my original camp who saved my life. And, 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 and they shot them all. So, so we were about, I don't know, 10, 12,000 people there. And then they set up the barracks that we were in, were made out of thin, thin wood with spaces between them. And it was January, it was cold. The wind blew right through it. And of course, once they put up machine guns in the watchtowers all around the camp, there were only 2,000 people left. Some of my friends did not make it out of that camp. And the Russian, we, we, we could hear the front coming close, airplanes, bombs. And the, the watchtowers were above a wall, a cement wall, higher than any person could climb. And there was a hole from a cannon of what, I don't know, that's created in that wall. 
and every time and there was a German there behind that wall, a guard with a automatic weapon, and every time somebody stuck his head out through the wall, he was he was pulled back dead. And they kept on doing it day after day after day. And then, and then one day, people still tried. The shooting stop, stopped, and maybe a day later or two days later, there was no place to hide. The Russians came in. Who was my holy man? Our ages don't, did not match enough to be friends that would converse a lot. He was in his thirties, a medical doctor from Hungary. I was then 14 and a half years old, a raw kid, a confused prisoner of Auschwitz from a Polish Jewish Orthodox home. In early 44, Dr. Nikolai was a medical doctor in the Hungarian Air Force. One day the Gestapo arrested him and he ended up in Auschwitz because one of his grandparents was Jewish. To me, he lived as a Jew in his heart, in his soul, in his deed. He died in Silesia together with 8,000 Jews, my fellow camp prisoners, inmates. <laughs> who were ex executed when the Germans retreated. He is one of my six million martyrs, one of my brothers. When I came back from the concentration camp. We walked for about two weeks because there was no, uh, no me other means to get home. When I got home, somebody else lived in our place. This was our property, uh, and the woman opened the door and she recognized me from before and she had a big knife in her hand and she says, if you ever give me trouble, I'll personally kill you. That was my welcome home. I went in, I looked around, the old furniture is all gone, everything that we had is, wasn't there, but the bed that I mentioned was still standing there. It was a four-post carved wood bed. Who's the holy man? The holy man is you and me and every other person who remembers his or her obligation. What was this obligation? It was to remember the benefits we have received from others who help make us what we are. As my holy man said to me with only four little words, just pass it on. Thank you.